Amen. Welcome to church. God bless you. So glad that you're here. If you're new, my name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor. Vox is one church that, uh, that meets in 11 different locations. And so all across Connecticut, Massachusetts, we're streaming live to Hartford and to Middletown and to New Britain and a bunch of other places. Can we say good morning, church? Good morning, Clinton. Good morning, Springfield. Hello. Welcome to church. So glad you're here. Hey, friends, some exciting news in the world of Vox Church. I don't know if you heard on social media or you heard in an email but, uh, but this past week, we officially purchased 129 Lafayette Street in downtown Hartford, Connecticut. It's awesome. It's awesome. This building um, is going to be a real beacon. To the right is Superior Court. To the left is City Hall. It is right in the heart of the capital city. Thank you, Jesus. I am telling you, the team at Vox has been working on this project to purchase this building for almost four years. And uh, it has been long. If you've been around, I've been talking about it. It's going to happen, and then wait, it's going to happen, and then wait, and then it's going to It took a while, but, uh, but we purchased, praise the Lord. And uh, so we are grateful, grateful for your patience, grateful for your faith, your generosity. Very exciting. Construction will start uh, pretty soon. And so, so thankful for all that God's going to do in the city of Hartford. I'm telling you, friends, the dream. The dream to see New England changed from the least church region to the most spiritually vibrant place on earth. The Lord is moving it forward. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's awesome. It's awesome. Gospel of John, part two. If you didn't get one of these reading plans, grab one before you go. We're reading the Gospel of John together, one chapter at a time. I'm telling you, you can do it. One chapter at a time, uh, one day at a time. And, uh, and so I just encourage you, follow along with us. If you followed along, today would be day eight. So it's, uh, it's the eighth chapter of John today. Tomorrow will be chapter nine. After that comes chapter 10. And then you've got chapter 11 from there. And then we're gonna do the whole thing again, and then the whole thing again. And the idea here is to saturate our summer in the Gospel of John and really go deep and really begin to internalize the truths of this Gospel. Last week, we talked about the overarching theme of this book, John tells us in John 20, verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, right? So Jesus has been doing all kinds of things, John says, but these are written that you may, what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's a lot in there, but it tells us that Jesus wants you to be alive not to exist, not to maintain, but to be fully alive. That's God's intention for your life. And it's found in Jesus. That kind of life is found in Jesus. More specifically, it's found through faith in Jesus. Uh, 98 times in the Gospel of John, we find this word, believe. That's more than Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined, all right? John is passionate that you would have ample evidence to believe that you could get to a place where you see and understand the truth of God. I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said that the riddles of God are more satisfying than the answers of man. And so a lot of times, or the explanations of man, a lot of times in our lives we, we, uh, we want everything to be clean and everything to be fully understood. And that's not the way it often works with Jesus, but he brings us on this journey where we learn to trust him. And that's what he's doing in your life right now. And so last week we looked at the first sign, water being turned into wine. Today we're going to look at what John calls the second sign. It's in John chapter 4, verse 46. It says, So he, that Jesus, came to, to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water wine. So he's back in the same town. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. That's one o'clock, the seventh hour. And the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. This is God's word. And today I want to teach on the process of faith. That's what we're going to call 
the sermon today, the process of faith. Would you pray with me? Every location, let's open our hearts to Jesus. Lord, we just open ourselves to you right now. I pray that you take these words that we just read and you make them living and active in us. Lord, help us to identify where we are in the process of faith. We don't want information alone. We want transformation. And so, Lord, we do invite you right now. Just make it personal. Lord, I invite you right now. Would you bring me along this process of faith in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Photosynthesis. Pollination, decomposition, the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, the nervous system, the changing of seasons, the rotation of the earth, the changing of the tides. Behind all of these natural phenomena, there is a process. There is a process. Photosynthesis, the, the uh, I don't really know much about photosynthesis, but the, <laughs> let's pretend for a moment, shall we? The plants absorb the sunlight and the carbon dioxide and they turn it into, minox, I don't know, and they turn it into oxygen. It's very good. We're all thankful for photosynthesis. <laughs> it's a big deal. But, uh, but all these different processes or stages, right? There are different steps in the process. And it's very important that you understand the steps, not necessarily of photosynthesis, but of a variety of different things in life, and I'm thankful that somebody understands them, right? Because if nobody understood the cardiovascular system, if nobody understood the nervous system, we'd have a lot of problems. Back in the day, they used to just bleed people, they bloodletting, right? Hope that it would help, and in some instances, maybe it did, but in the vast majority of instances, it was not helping, it was hurting, because they misunderstood the systems. They misunderstood the process of the human body, and because they came to false conclusions, they had unhelpful methods. So it is with faith. Faith is a process in our lives. We have a lot of misunderstandings about how faith works. Some people think of faith like a personality trait, you know, like, oh, grandma, she had faith, right? And, and she didn't really ever ask questions. She never doubted anything. I wish I had faith like grandma, but I'll never have faith like grandma. I'm a, I'm a questioner. I'm more of an intellectual. I don't really have that kind of faith, you know? And so we think of faith like a personality trait, like that girl can sing, that guy's got faith, right? Like it's just some, a talent. Somebody has a talent and they can do that, but that is not the way the Bible describes faith at all. The Bible describes faith working in every personality. And so it's the Apostle Paul, the great scholar, and it's Peter, the fisherman. Faith finds its way into a thousand different personality traits and circumstances and grows in every one. And so it doesn't just work for one. The substance of faith will be the same, even though the expression may be different. You may have loud faith. You may have quiet faith. You may have a more intellectual faith. You may have a more simple faith. But that substance of trust in God is the same underneath the surface. Other people think that faith is like an on-off switch. You either have it or you don't. You have it or you don't. And that's really not the way the Bible describes faith either. Faith is consistently described not like an on-off switch, but more like photosynthesis, a process that has stages. And it's not that you graduate from one. That's not really the idea. It's instead that you're progressing, that you're moving. When Jesus described the kingdom of heaven, he said it like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 13, is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. So this is the process of fermentation where the yeast changes the dough and causes it to rise. And he's saying, that's really how my kingdom works in your life, that it's progressing, that it's moving you somewhere. But the problem for many people is we don't know the process of faith. We don't understand how faith progresses. And because we don't understand how faith progresses, we end up fighting against the process of faith. We end up actually short-circuiting it or causing bigger problems because we just didn't know where we were headed. And that's where this story begins. It begins with an official. Now, that means that he worked for the government, all right? He probably worked for Herod at that time, and he was sort of a big deal. But I want you to see right away that the Gospel of John is doing something intentional. If you spent the last couple of days reading John 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you've started to see that John is placing Jesus with different people in different circumstances. In John chapter 1, we find Jesus with the fishermen. 
and they become his disciples. In John chapter 3, we find Jesus with Nicodemus, a rabbi and a religious leader, highly respected, highly educated. In John chapter 4, we find Jesus with a social outcast, a Samaritan woman who's had five different men in her life, or six different men in her life. And so he's got all these different people. Now, at the end of chapter 4, we've got him with this government official. So think about what John is doing. From the fisherman to the rabbi, from the rabbi to the outcast, from the outcast to the government official, what he wants you to see is that this thing called the kingdom of heaven is for all people everywhere. It's for the old people and the young people. It's for the rich people and the poor people. It's for the white people and the black people. It's for every race, color, creed. It's for every person and people group on earth. And a lot of times, especially in our modern context, we assume that the Christian faith is actually declining. If you live in New England, it's easy to think that way because maybe none of your friends or maybe none of your coworkers are following Christ. But friend, what you have to understand is that is a very narrow perspective, that the Christian faith is in fact expanding at a more rapid rate than any other time in history, that the followers of Christ are becoming more numerous than any other time on earth, you don't have to take my word for it. The Washington Post a couple years ago uh, put out an article based on the Pew Research Group's research, and the title of the article was, The World is Expected to Become More Religious, Not Less. In the article, they noted that the percentage of those who identify as atheist, agnostic, or religiously unaffiliated has been steadily declining and is going to continue for at least the next 40 years to decline worldwide. A couple of examples, in 1970, there were about 11 million professing Christians in East Asia. 11 million in 1970. Today, there are over 171 million. That entire region is being transformed. Even more extreme in Africa, in the continent of Africa. 1910, there were about 12 million followers of Christ. 1910. All right, today, just over 100 years later, there are over 630 million professing Christians on the continent of Africa. From 12 million, what is that... It's the, it's, it's the kingdom of heavens like yeast. It's spreading. It's spreading to every people group. It's spreading to every, uh, every language, every tribe, every tongue. It's not an American thing. It's not a Western thing. It is a worldwide supernatural movement. And friend, by the way, that's why we're here at Vox, because we believe that now is the time for that kingdom to really take root and expand across New England. Now is the time for eyes to be open, hearts to be awakened, families to be transformed by the good news of God's grace through Christ. And so this is what we see. It's awesome. And this man comes to Jesus. He didn't know Jesus, this father. He, he comes to Jesus because he heard stories and he was desperate. What was his situation? His son was about to die. And so think about, you know, the situation. If, if you were there, you would certainly probably do the same thing. Capernaum to Cana was about 15 to 20 miles, and this man gets there as quick as he can. He probably tried everything for his son to be healed. Nothing worked. He became desperate. He heard about a healer, and in desperation, he comes to Jesus. He says, please come and heal my son. Now, I want you to see that this story is, is a sign. It's pointing us to how faith works. And what we need to see is that faith almost always begins <laughs> with a situation that I can't handle. It begins when I come to the end of myself. Some people have no faith because they, they've lived in the delusion that they can handle it their whole life. Even though you're not making the synapses in your brain fire, you're not keeping your heart pumping, that God could just, whoop, take that away at any moment, at any time, and yet you're living in the delusion that you're in control. Go ahead and turn to the person next to you and tell them you're not actually in control. Come on, just tell them. You're not. It's just, it, it's a mirage, my friend. It's not real. You're not in control. And, and when you face that, you often turn to God. That's where faith starts. And so, you know, maybe for you it started with addiction. You couldn't handle the addiction. And so you turned to a higher power. You said, there's got to be something more because I can't handle this. Or maybe for you it was a crisis. A family member died or something happened in your life and you couldn't handle it. And you turned to God. Maybe for you it was an emptiness where you say, Justin, I've tried it all. I've tried this pleasure and that pleasure and it's not enough. There's an emptiness because God is calling you to himself. C.S. Lewis said it like this. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God gets our attention. And this is what I'll call today the first stage of faith. Seeking faith. Seeking faith is the first stage of faith. And so this man hears the testimony of others, and he travels the 15, 20 miles, 
and he gets there because his son is in need. Question for you today. Do you have seeking faith? You don't have to answer that out loud. But you never graduate from seeking faith. It's always a part of the believer's life. You know, if you're not sure the degree of your seeking faith, you can find a direct correlation between seeking faith and your prayer life. And if your prayer life doesn't exist, then your seeking faith is clearly very small. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Prayer is an exercise in faith. And if I don't make time to pray, if I don't make time to seek God, then clearly my faith isn't very significant in my life. And so we can all put on, right? And I'm not throwing stones. I'm gathering stones today, all right? We're going to grow. But, but I, what, I'm, what I'm showing you today is that, that we can all kind of put on about being people of faith, but, but God actually sees us in secret. And what we do in secret is the evidence of what's truly taken root in our lives. And so I'm not there to discourage you. I'm actually here to encourage you that if you would just engage in seeking God, your faith will grow. That's a pretty easy formula. Just start taking more time to pray. You might not know what to say. You might not know how to say it. Just make the space for it. And that seeking faith will start to mature. You might say, I don't know where to start. You could start in John chapter 8 today. That's what we're doing together. And then tomorrow, try John chapter 9. After that, do John chapter 10. And let's together seek him through the scriptures. Seeking faith is so simple, and it's where we begin, all right? It's where we begin. Jeremiah 29, there's a promise. God says, you will seek me, look at this, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You know what I found? A lot of people have never really found God for themselves, they may go to church, they may feel inspired, grandma may have faith, their husband may have faith, their wife may have faith, but they've never actually taken the step into seeking faith for themselves. Look at that promise. That promise changed my life. It tells you that if you just go with your whole heart, you are certain to find God for yourself, certain to find him for yourself. Take him up on that. Trust it. That's an invitation. But seeking faith has its limits because it's only the first stage of faith, right? And what I found in my own life and I think in the lives of many people is that seeking faith is often immature. It's immature in that it can quickly become an attempt to get God to do what I want him to do. You know what I mean? And so seeking faith can often be marked by superstition or by tradition where you go, well, if I pray this number of prayers or if I give this much money, then God owes me and he'll do that for me. So it's kind of like vending machine faith. You know what I mean? I put in the dollar, you give me the cookies, right? And so we're making an exchange. And so a lot of times in seeking faith, if it's young, we think that the goal is to get something from God. And friend, I want to tell you, that's an immature understanding of faith because the goal ultimately is never to get something from God because the something you get from God will never satisfy you because you weren't made to get something from God. What you really need is God himself. And so instead of just seeking his hand, seek his heart, seek his face, seek him in your life. And so seeking faith has to mature beyond just getting from God to actually getting God to actually growing in God. And you might say, well, I don't even want that. I don't even want that. Well, then the faith isn't genuine because a true faith is always going to see beyond just me getting what I want and it's going to grow. It's going to mature. It's going to expand. And that's what we see happen to this man. He comes to Jesus because he just has a need. He's not interested in following Jesus, as far as we can tell. He's not interested in much of that at all. He just wants God to fix his problem, right? And so he says, Jesus, would you please heal my son? And did you notice how Jesus responds? Verse 48, look at it with me. Jesus says this. So Jesus said to him, Phew. that's not in there, but I think it's in there. Phew. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, that seems kind of mean, doesn't it? I mean, this man is desperate. His son is about to die. He comes to Jesus, and it kind of feels like Jesus blows him off. And if you've been following, you remember last week when Jesus was at the wedding, and his mom says, Jesus, they have no wine. And he goes, woman, what's that have to do with me? Right? I don't think he said it like that, but I'm just saying, that's what he said. And so what, what are we learning about Jesus. We are learning that he will almost never respond the way you think. And so if you think he's going to respond exactly as you expect him to respond, you are sorely mistaken. He is not going to. Yeah, come on, one person that was like, amen to that. But <laughs> he's not going to. And this is where a lot of people get hung up in their faith because they go, well, I, I can't trust him. I don't know. He didn't do what I asked. He didn't do it the way I thought he was going to do it. 
And so we get offended, but that's not how this man responds. Look how this man responds. The official said to him, verse 49, Sir, I love that. Come in low. Sir, come down before my child dies. He asks him the same thing again. He just repeats himself. But he starts with a sir this time. He comes in low. He's humble, but he's tenacious. What's happening here? I want to suggest to you that Jesus in this instance is testing the man. Remember the story of Jacob. He meets God in the wilderness and they wrestle. And God dislocates Jacob's hip. And Jacob holds on and says, I won't let you go until you bless me. It's a crazy story. Remember the story of Naaman. He's dying of leprosy. And the prophet tells him, go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman's like, seven times? Are you kidding? And God heals him. But it was a test. Or you think about the story of Elijah, where Elijah prays for rain. And after the first prayer, nothing changes. And after the second prayer, nothing changes. And after the third prayer, nothing changes. It's not until the seventh prayer that a cloud the size of a man's hand is seen on the horizon. What are all these stories teaching us? They're not teaching us that you have to earn your way to God by giving enough through prayer. No, 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 no. They're teaching us that the quality of your faith will be tested and you're gonna need some grit. You're gonna need some endurance in your faith. When Jesus described the life of faith in prayer, he described it as a man who needed a loaf of bread from his neighbor and started knocking on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night. And the neighbor told him to go away. This is Jesus' story. The neighbor told him to go away. And the man said, I'm not leaving. And the neighbor said, leave me alone. And he said, no. And he said, leave me alone. And he said, no. And finally, not even because he liked the guy, but because he just wanted him to go away, he gave him the loaf of bread. That's the story Jesus gives us to describe prayer that gets answered. What is he teaching us? He's teaching us that our seeking faith must mature to this second stage that today we'll call Tested faith. Tested faith. Tested faith is when God puts you through the fire. Proverbs 17, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. And the Lord, he tests the hearts. Now, this is very difficult for us. And let's just be honest, because we live in a profoundly comfortable world. You get your coffee just the way you like it. And if you don't, you take it back. You get those scrambled eggs just the way you like them. And if they're cold, you take them back, right? We are used to being catered to and we love comfort. And so the fact that God would make you uncomfortable on purpose is very uncomfortable. We don't like that idea. We don't like the fact that God would make us uncomfortable. But look, just look at nature, for example. The human body cannot build muscle unless it is torn. It must be torn in order for it to grow. The human mind cannot grow in intellect unless it is stretched, unless it learns things that it hasn't yet learned. And so the mind must be stretched. The body must be torn. So it is with faith. The way God grows faith is by putting you in uncomfortable situations and teaching you to trust him. And you might think that that's not loving. Friend, that is the most loving thing he could do. But you have to begin to see it a little differently. And so he comes to the man. This is wild. Or the man comes to him and he says, please come down, right? Please come down. Two times he says that. Come down and, and heal my son. Why does he say that? Well, they're in Cana and Capernaum was down. He was literally lower elevation. He had to come down the mountain to get to Capernaum. And so he's saying, please come down. But Jesus is unwilling to come. And so he says, now I'm not going to go. I'll just say it. Now, I can imagine this guy's going, all right, hold on. Um, I read the stories of Moses. I read the stories of Elijah. I've read every miracle story in the Bible. Nobody just says it. You got to come. That's how it works, Jesus. You got to come. You got to pray for him. That's how the healing comes. Don't, don't just say it. You got to actually, that's, I can imagine that's what he's thinking, right? But Jesus just says, no, no, I'm just going to say it and we're good. See, he doesn't want the man, he doesn't want to come down. He wants the man to come up. He wants the man to come up to a more mature faith. He's being tested. Because in your life, many times, there is a gap between what you think you believe and what you actually believe. And the only way, I know this is uncomfortable, the only way to bridge that gap is the test. The only way for your faith to actually grow is for it to be buffeted and tested. You probably, you may have heard this story before, but... Uh, the acrobat Charles Blondin, he was famous for uh, walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Now, that's something I would never want to do, but, but Charles Blondin was very good at it. He walked forward. He walked backwards. Uh, one time, he walked in shackles. 
Another time, he walked blindfolded across the tightrope at Niagara Falls, and the huge crowds would come. I mean, everybody would come. It was a really big deal many years ago. And one time, he flipped, backflipped the whole way uh, down the tightrope from one side to the other to Ni- of Niagara Falls. Another time, he walked across on a wheelbarrow, uh, and uh, holding a wheelbarrow. And the crowd cheered and everybody. And when he finished that, he went over to the crowd. And he said, he said, I've crossed Niagara Falls so many different ways. How many of you believe I could put a man in this wheelbarrow? You know where this is going. How many of you believe I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and walk across Niagara Falls? And the crowd said, yes. And he said, do you believe I could do it? And they said, yes. And he said, do you really believe? And they said, we really believe. And he said, I need a volunteer. <laughs> right? Nobody, right? (laughs) Well, I don't believe that much, right? There was a gap. There was a gap between what they thought they believed and what they functionally believed. And this is where so many of us get tripped up. Because he's not going to do it the way you thought. I thought he was going to come. I thought he was going to lay his hand on my son. But now he's just talking about saying it. That's not the way it's supposed to go. That's not the plan. How do you do when your plan gets interrupted? I was talking to somebody the other day. They were so angry because their life wasn't going as they planned. You're here. And you say, oh, I, I, I planned on being married. But I'm not. And, 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 and it's messing. It's, but maybe in the process, God is teaching you a peace that's going to change your whole life forever. And maybe he's doing it through that trial. Or you thought that this physical ailment would have been solved by now. But maybe through the process, God's going to use you in the life of your doctor or in the life of your family to testify of your confidence in Jesus. Or maybe you get passed up for that promotion and you thought that you would have gotten further in your business by now. But God is training you through the process that he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. And that it's not the size of your job, it's the size of your trust. And you can rely on him to provide for you in all circumstances, no matter where you find yourself. See, there's a process going on, and it's not going to go the way you think. It's not going to go the way you think because you're working from a framework that's temporal, where God is working from a framework that's eternal. See, we're just trying to solve today's problem and avoid as much discomfort as possible. And he's trying to make us into eternal beings who can judge angels. (laughs) He's doing so much more. He is conforming you into the image of his son for eternal purposes, even beyond this life. And so you got to begin to grasp his bigger purpose. And seeking faith moves to tested faith when you stop dictating the terms to Jesus. And you start saying, all right, Lord. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know if you're going to do it the way I thought you were going to do it. But I trust you anyways. I trust you anyways. And you might be here and you stopped trusting when a problem came that felt too big. And I want to just, I want to encourage you. If that's, if that's where you found yourself, then you've missed a great secret of faith. See, the great secret of tested faith is that it's rooted in a conviction that God is good. The scripture from Genesis to Revelation declares that God is just, that he's holy, that he's loving, and that he's good. That God is good. In fact, it tells us that God works together all things for good. It doesn't say that all things are good, but it says that he works them all together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And so if you love the Lord, that means you're called according to his purpose. He's gonna work for your good. He's gonna work for your good in every circumstance, even in this life and the next. And so sometimes we see it and sometimes it steps into eternity. But either way, he is working it for his glory and for your good. And the way we endure testing is by the conviction that God is not selfish, he's not vindictive, he's not distant, he's not weak. Which means that if he's really good, he will never ask you to do anything and then not give you the grace to overcome. Check this out. Think about your life right now, the situation you're facing, the financial crisis, the the relational problem, the et cetera, et cetera, the loss, whatever it might be. What I'm telling you is that for every follower of Christ, God has already put in you what you need to overcome. It's already there. The faith you need, the endurance you need, the confidence you need, the strength you need, the peace you need, it's already residing in you because a good God doesn't give you a trial and then not give you the capacity to handle it. And so that means that whatever you're looking at, it's about looking at it differently. Rather than I can't, you begin to say he can. 
Rather than, you, rather than I'm not, you begin to say he is. Because you realize that the one who rose from the dead lives inside of you, which means that you have everything you need to overcome. Isaiah 41, fear not, I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, I'm your God. I'll strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know how many times that one's got me through when it feels like I can't do it and then I grab a hold of that verse and I stay because the test enables me to Mature. It's going to be uncomfortable, but on the other side of the test, there's peace. I want to show you this, verse 50. Look at the peace that this man finds. It says, so Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. What brought peace to this anxious father? He believed the word of God. That's what it was. Now, there's something interesting going on here, and I want to show it to you because it's easy to miss. We're told very specifically that this man encounters Jesus and Jesus says, go home, your son's going to be healed, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, all right? It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Then we're told that the next day, on his way, he meets his servants who have come to him to tell him that his child has recovered, right? And so that's what we learn here. Very interesting. Okay, fine, but you got to follow this. Capernaum to Cana, the two towns that are described here, 15 to 20 miles. This man is an official, almost definitely had a horse, if he had a horse, that's like a two-hour horse ride, okay? If he didn't have a horse, five to six-hour walk. Now, if you're this dad and Jesus just tells you that your son's healed, go home, are you going to walk or are you going to run? You're going to go as quick as you can. You're gonna, I would. I would go as quick as I can. Now, we're told, stay with this, he, we're told that he meets his servants the next day on his way home. So it's one o'clock, John tells us all this on purpose, it's one o'clock in the afternoon that Jesus tells him, your son's healed, go home. And then let's just assume he meets, it's the next day, so let's just assume he meets his servants at 8 a.m. in the morning, okay? If he met them at 8 in the morning, that's 19 hours to make a five to six hour walk, or 19 hours to make a one to two hour horse ride. What are we learning? This man is walking really slow. He is walking at a snail's pace. He is doing the opposite of what we expect him to do. And John tells us this because he wants us to see that his faith has progressed, that there is a shift that's occurred inside this man where he's gone from seeking faith to tested faith to resting faith. He's not rushing because somehow he knows it's done. The old saints called it praying through. When you get to a point in your spirit where you know that you know that you know that God is going to work and peace comes. It doesn't mean you know how. It doesn't mean you know when. It doesn't even matter how or when because you know that you know. You know that God has heard your prayer. You know that God is going to work and you have an assurance. You have a certainty. You've gone through the struggle of seeking. You've wrestled with God like Jacob. You've been tested and now you've come out and you have a sense of certainty. I know in my bones that my Redeemer lives and he's not going to let me down. That's resting faith. And you can get there. You can have your whole life defined by resting faith. Some of us, we've been living in seeking faith for so long, or we've been living in tested faith for so long. God's bringing you somewhere today, friend. He's showing you the horizon that you can live with a rest. John Wesley experienced this rest in the area of salvation. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And assurance, there it is, was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I can remember when I begin to experience that assurance, do you have assurance that your sins are forgiven? Do you have assurance that you're loved by God? Because you can, but you gotta stay with the process. Seek, seek, seek. Walk through the test. Trust in his goodness. Hold to his word. And then the rest comes. Then the rest comes. That's what this man did. The shift occurred when he took Jesus at his word. What does it mean to take Jesus at his word? It means that the word of God holds a higher standing than your own word or the word of anybody else. That's what it means. It means that I believe God's truth over what I feel. I be, this is maturity. I believe God's truth over what I think because the riddles of God are more satisfying 
than the answers of man. I believe his word. I believe in his word even more than I can understand or I can fully grasp the truth. And we have to understand here that John's doing something specific. I don't want you to miss it. Because if you notice, this idea of the word, it's, it kind of runs all through the gospel of John. In fact, John starts with it. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. We looked at it last week. But John uses a particular word in the Greek language for the word word. It gets a little confusing. It's the word logos, okay? And, and what we have to understand is that, that word logos, that term, was very pregnant with meaning in that culture, okay? And he does this on purpose. The Greek philosophers at the time, they taught that the whole universe was functioning with a particular balance or harmony or, or logic, and behind it all was an impersonal set of principles, an impersonal set of rules, the rules of nature, right? The laws of nature. The Greek philosophers called the laws of nature the impersonal framework of the universe. They called that the logos. That was the term they used, very common. Everybody knew about it at the time. So that was the logos. The logos was the impersonal, absolute truth that kind of held the world together. The harmony, the logic, the balance, the, 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 uh, the, the, the truth that kind of kept everything working. It was the changing of seasons, the cardiovascular system, all those pictures of the logos, the reason behind the world. Now, the various different Greek philosophy groups, they, they argued about what the essence of the logos was. The Stoics had one view, the Epicureans had another view, and then John writes this gospel. Historians have called the Gospel of John, and specifically John chapter 1, the greatest earthquake in history because John introduced an idea that blew the world apart, changed the world forever, and stunned the philosophers of his age because he said that the Logos is not just an impersonal group of principles. It is not just a harmonious concept that governs the cosmos. The Logos is a person. It's Jesus. The Logos is reason personified, logic made accessible, ultimate reality fully realized. And when you trust his word, your life comes into harmony with truth itself. He says that is the light that illuminates the life of a human being. Jesus is the Logos. So John is playing upon that theme. And he says, this man, he believed the Logos. This man, he took Jesus at the Logos. In other words, he adopted Christ as his word. And this is where he found rest. And this is where God is leading you. He's leading you to a place where you trust his word above all else. And as you do, you find resting faith. And John wants to give you ample evidence to rest in Christ. Look what he says in verse 53. The father knew that the hour when Jesus had said to him, excuse me, the father knew that was the hour that Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, look at this, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did. Not the second miracle, just the second sign when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Now, right away, you should notice that he tells us that the man believed, which he's already told us. So why is he telling us again that this father believed? He wants us to see that faith is a process, that we can grow in our faith, that we can progress in our faith, and that now it's spilling out on his wife, his kids, his neighbors, his friends. He's gone from seeking faith to tested faith, from tested faith to resting faith, and from resting faith to living faith. Living faith. Living faith is when my faith spills over. Living faith is when my faith begins to transform the world around me. The social ecosystem, my sphere of influence is transformed by my love for Christ and my service of others. That's where living faith begins to change society, begins to transform. You can put that little staircase up there. So we see that it begins by seeking God. That's where everything starts, just by seeking him. You know, uh, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews says that anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That's where we start. But there from, from that place, we're going to go through some tests and we have to decide, am I going to let God's word be God's word or am I going to let my word be God's word? Which one rules my life? And as we choose Christ, we move into resting faith. And resting faith brings a peace and that peace starts to overflow. And that's where we learn to live in living faith. 
living faith. And John calls this the second sign. So what specifically is the second sign? Well, the second sign is certainly the boy being healed. That's the miracle. But it's more than that. The second sign is the walk of faith. The walk of faith. That the kingdom of God is like yeast in dough. That when you believe in Christ as your logos, as your word over your life, your life expands. And you begin to transform the world all around you. And the result is flourishing. Peace, hope, joy, love. And this is why we're here, friends. We're here because we believe that the living word is still alive. That it can change your life today. That you can experience that peace, that hope, that joy, that love. You can experience it right now. Maybe you're here and you find yourself being tested. Maybe you're here and you've actually doubted the goodness of God. And you say, you know, I don't even know. If, I, don't, I don't think God is good. How could he be good if he let this loved one die? How could he be good if he allowed this trap? How could he be good? And we all have our different questions. Where do you look when life doesn't make sense? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us specifically, he says, look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. See, see the cross is the irrefutable evidence of the goodness of God. The cross didn't make sense to anyone at the time, but it was salvation for the world. The cross looked like weakness, turned out to be strength. On the cross, Jesus took your sin. On the cross, Jesus paid your debt. On the cross, Jesus earned peace with God for you. He died so that you could have his life. He suffered so that you could be accepted through grace. On the cross, Jesus changed the world and he proved that God loves you. In fact, Paul goes so far as to say that if God didn't spare his own son but gave him up for you, how will he not graciously give you all things? The cross is your evidence that God is good and that God is strong. And that even though you won't always understand his ways, you can trust him. Think about Jesus. He expressed to us the stages of faith in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had seeking faith as he sweat blood and cried out to his father. And then before his accusers, he was silent, expressing tested faith. He was brought up on that cross and he cried out, it is finished. He stepped into resting faith. And then three days later, Jesus came alive again and showed us living faith. And here's what gets us through. That the same one who rose again now lives in those who believe. He lives in you. And if he lives in you, you can make it through. Would you stand with me today? I want to invite you into a moment of personal reflection in your process of faith. Where are you? As you think about these stages, remember, they don't go away. They often overlap. Life isn't just this clean little progression. But as you look at your life, maybe you've stalled out in seeking God. You don't have that spiritual hunger to read the Bible and to pray. Don't wait for the feeling. Step out by faith. Begin to pray. Begin to seek God. And your seeking faith will grow. Or maybe you find yourself in the middle of the test. And you've been discouraged and you've been frustrated and you've been alone. Take a hold of his word. Search the scripture for a promise and grab a hold of it. And let that promise be a louder voice than any other voice in your life. I believe your word, God. I take a hold of your word. Or maybe it's time to step into living faith where you share with your family members and friends the rest that God has provided for you. Wherever you find yourself today, I want to challenge you to take the next step. Take the next step. The spirit of Jesus is here right now calling you to take the next step. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you come? Lord, in the name of Jesus, would you come? And would you rest on your people? Spirit of the living God, 
As we sing today, I pray that you would stretch us and that you would grow our faith, that you would show us our next step in this process of faith. Holy Spirit, restore those who are discouraged. Strengthen those who are weak. Empower those who need an infusion of your strength right now. Lord, would you come even as we sing in Jesus' name.